Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Clarity Christian College, formerly known as Florida Bible College. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. And have a different lifestyle. It's all because Jesus Christ paid my sin debt. Do I hear an amen on that? Now, when he died, he just didn't die like his, his heart stopped beating. He died a horrible, brutal, mocking court scene. Then he, his body was so marred that Scripture says you wouldn't even recognize him. And then he died up there on this cross a horrible way with so much embarrassment because he loved you and me. You know, I've done this so many times, but since we've got some in the ministry here, watch how I do this and you use it as well, okay? Watch carefully. Let my right hand represent you and me and my wallet represents sin. The Bible says we're all sinners. We inherited that lifestyle and that sin from our forefathers and from Adam, so we got it from them. Can't get rid of it. That's it. No matter what kind of a father or mother you had, you still have that sin. The Bible says because I'm a sinner like this, I'm destined to be separated from him by nature and choice forever in hell. The Bible says to go to heaven, I've got to be perfect, but I'm not. I have sin on me. The Bible says no good deed I do myself will get to heaven. Over and over again, it's not by my works. Let my left hand represent God I took on flesh. Nothing on it to represent sin because he was sinless. I have a wallet on my right hand to represent sin because I'm sinful. So are you, so is everyone in the world. And my sin separates me from him, separates me from heaven. That's Old Testament, New Testament, it's all over there. Now watch what happens. The Bible says that Jesus Christ ransomed us. He was without spot or blemish because Old Testament type said that when that lamb was to be sacrificed, there could be no blemish. You couldn't give a, an, an old lamb that was kind of broken and had mange. Now ah, we don't need it, probably won't taste good anywhere. Let's sacrifice that to God. No, we were to take the best that we could and Jesus was the best without spot and blemish. And when he died, look what he did. His blood was shed. He took all my sin on himself. Not part of my sin, but all of my sin. We don't pay for part sin. He doesn't pay for part sin. He took all my sin on himself. He died and he rose again. Now, by what he did, that's the beginning of the motivation for me to think, behave, and to have a whole new lifestyle. It's not about me. And yeah, God promises rewards and God promises never to leave us. But at the same time, it's all because he died for me. So I don't care what I have to go through. It's worth it because of what he did for me. Is there a witness on that? I'm telling you, that's my motivation because with all of that, he didn't do it begrudgingly. He said, I love you. I want you in heaven. I have a better lifestyle for you. I have to do this for you so you can have all of this. And he was so motivated by love. So let's look at number three. Because Jesus paid a price for you. He paid a price for you and me. Nothing I could ever do could ever earn eternal life. So all this holiness is not so that I have eternal life. It's because he gave me eternal life. Some of you, um, maybe this might help you. Do you remember years ago when there was the earthquake in California? Do you remember that uh, freeway bridge? I, I forget what bridge it was. You all know, was it Oakland Bridge or one of those bridges? It caved in with the cars that were kind of pancaked underneath and there was like an opening there and some of the cars were sliding down. If any of you remember any of that, say, uh-huh. uh-huh. Okay. Now, what I'm saying is that we're going through life, you know, diddly-bopping through life, okay? The bridge has already been broken. That, that bridge was way, way long gone, okay? But we're diddly-bopping through life thinking we're on a freeway to, to good things. And all of a sudden, we come to that end of that freeway. And by God's grace, we didn't die yet. That's huge. By God's grace, you that are on the outside wanting to be on the inside, you haven't died yet. God loved you that much. He kept you alive. And he brought you to hear this message where this bridge is right here. The weird thing is, is that you don't know when you're going to die. I don't either, but neither do you. I don't either, but neither do you. So if that's the case, here's what he says. To get to the other side... A relationship with Christ, a relationship in heaven forever. He says there's only one thing that's going to match that bridge together. And that's going to be, we talk about the cross, but it's not just a wooden cross. It's what he did on the cross for us when he died and he rose again. And he says, I'll bridge that for you. Now watch, even though he bridged it, we still have to make the choice that we're going to trust him. So we have to, in a sense, step out on that cross experience by faith, believing that we'll get to the other side. Now, you can stop there and you can spend your whole life analyzing, is this truth or not? You'll never get to the other side. So I hope you'll trust Christ as your Savior. 
That's about the best image that I possibly can give to you. It's his love that did it. Look in verse 20 and 21 if you're following along expositionally here. Here's what it says. He, referring to Christ, was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. Would you underline that? You were on his mind when he was on the cross. When he was on the cross, he bore your sin. For the sake of you, who through Christ are now believers in God, who did what? Raised Christ from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope would be in God. I love that. Look up here, if you will, because I want to finish this illustration. Remember how I told you we're sinners separated from God? Jesus Christ loved us. He took all my sin on himself. He died and he rose again. You might say, wow, that is really great, but that doesn't help you get to heaven yet. He did all the work. He built the bridge. But now you must place your faith in Jesus Christ. And you don't do it by any amount of money you give, any church you join, any good deeds you do. You just simply take your childlike little baby faith that's no bigger than a grain of a mustard seed. But you place it in the right object, which is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ who died and paid for you. All your sins, all gone. That will give you eternal life. That again becomes the love that he did for me that now lives within me now. I can now love and reach out to other people. How beautiful that is. Because Jesus paid our sin debt. We now should be different. Let me give you three little points here and then we'll go. And that is that we need to have our discipline with our love. We need to have that discipline I was talking about, but it needs to be with our love. I know you're writing the word down and that's not as important as the verse. So would you follow along in verse 22 through verse 25? I'm going to make some comments right here. It follows verse 21. So remember, the end of verse 21 says, So that your faith and hope are in God. Then it goes right in. If you follow it in the Greek, it says, Having purified your souls. So in other words, you don't purify your souls. You don't have to do something to make your soul better with God. That having purified was done by God when you trusted Christ. That's your positional truth. Then it says, By your obedience to the truth. That's how your souls are purified. Now look up here again. I thought, Stan, you said it was just by faith alone. Here it says, obeying the truth. Well, first of all, you have to open up that whole concept. Jesus says, I am the way, the what? The truth. All right, so you have to obey the truth. You have to obey Jesus. All right, there's a lot that Jesus said. But in the context of what you have to do to have an eternal relationship with him, what he said was this. And I'm going to quote the words of Jesus. So this is Jesus speaking to you, not me. He says, truly, truly, I say unto you, he out there that believes on me has everlasting life. So what is he telling you have to do to have eternal life? Everyone? Believe. No. Believe in Christ. Uh, uh, uh. All right. Believe doesn't save you. It's the object. Now let's go back to it. Seriously. He said, believe in Christ. Now, he's telling you what to do to have everlasting life. So if you're going to obey the truth, you're obeying Jesus is the truth who gave you the truth that's going to heaven is by faith alone. So to obey that means you are now placing your faith in Christ. So it goes way beyond knowing that Jesus died, knowing he even died for you. It's now saying, he did that for me, therefore I'm going to trust him. That's obeying the truth. Once you do that, your souls are immediately purified. You are made pure and holy positionally. Now we have to live that out by the choices that we make. Let's go a little bit further. I love this now. Obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. That's where I get the discipline with your love. Then it tells you to love one another earnestly from a pure heart. That's the same pure heart that God gave you. Since you have been born again. Oh, I've been born again. How did I do that? Obeying the truth. Not by a perishable seed, but by an imperishable seed, which is the word of God. Then it says, for all flesh is like grass and all of its glory is like the flower of grass. In other words, it comes up and it dies. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And that's so true. That's so true. I, I, you, I would love for you to, you, anytime you're in Kulio'o, you come and see Stan and Carol. I want to take you to our house. I want to show you our backyard. We have a beautiful little backyard. Guys, you would love my backyard. It takes me eight minutes to mow the thing. I absolutely love it. But somehow it got a chinch bug. And I kept thinking, ah, it's, not, it's a little funny. I just need more water. And about two weeks later, a patch this big is, is deader than a doornail. So now I'm throwing poison on this thing, and Carol's grabbing the pets. You're going to kill the pets. You're going to kill the pets. I said, why do you think I'm throwing poison? No, I'm joking. So I'm, I put all this down here, and now it's coming back. But I'm going to tell you that grass withers, but the Word of God never does. And that's the beauty of this. But I would like you to look at this passage because it's so important. It says that we would love earnestly. You could put the word fervently. That means you don't just love in attitude. 
you love indeed. In other words, you seek ways to love with a pure heart. Now, if you want to take the word love one another, that phrase one, one another out and draw a line through that. And would you put the name of someone who is difficult to love, put their name in there, who is difficult to love. So since the Lord purified you because you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior, now with a sincere heart of love, you are going to love earnestly that person because you have been born again. Now, whoever that is, I want you to talk about that sandpaper person out there, that irregular person, as Litauer says. Whoever that might be. Now, don't look at your wife. Don't look at your husband. Don't look at your kids. You might look at me. I'm hard to live with, I know. But we're to love fervently those people. And that's what we do as a Christian. That is a part of thinking differently, acting differently, and then living a lifestyle of doing this. And I promise you there's going to be irregular people all over the world. It seems like they're all over the freeway, but that's another topic for another time. They're everywhere. There's a story told, I think this is true, but it was a pagan back in the early days when Christianity was starting to spread right after the New Testament was done. This was a pagan who was wanting to see are Christians really real or not. And he was going to report when he went through the Christian commune or whatever it was where these Christians were living, he did write a report back of his observation of what it was like to be around these Christians. And it was reduced to six words only. Behold how they love one another. Would you write that down? Behold how they love one another. So I say this in love and I'm saying it for me as well. If we had a pagan, an unsaved, unchurched skeptic out there, someone on, that's a late night comedian, we might say, that was sitting in the back of our minivan as we drove around the island, would they be able to say as they observed our family for that entire day, behold how they love one another? If they were outside of a door in a meeting that we were having as Christians, would they be able to say, behold how they love one another? When you were busy in your neighborhood with your little groups that you might have, whether it's a club, a committee, a team, if there was a pagan there, would they say, behold how they love one another? I would like that to be of our church. We might not have fancy building. We don't have a lot of fancy stuff here. But one thing we can have, we can have the love of God here. And now let me back up a little bit. I am so glad there is so much love in this church. So it's not really an indictment that you don't. So it's not, I'm not giving you a, an antibiotic because you don't love. What I'm really doing is giving you a vitamin so you continue to love. Amen? Amen. All right, let's go on. So you do want to love one another, and I hope that you'll do that. The second is to be disciplined with our words. Woo! I love that because loving is kind of neat. We have to kind of love one another, but it doesn't really articulate it as well as the rest of this verse. It says, so, that means built on what we just said from Scripture. So, put away from you all malice. So underline the word all, and then circle the word malice. And then it says, and all deceit. Underline the word all, circle the word deceit. And then hypocrisy, circle the word hypocrisy. And envy, circle the word envy. And slander, circle the word slander. Now, I know that these are not all words, but often our love will be displayed verbally by how we communicate. In most of these, you will see malice can be done in a very evil way with our tongue, with our deceit. We might not tell the whole truth. Hypocrisy. We come in and we tell everybody we really love them, we really love them. Behind their backs, we talk about them. With envy. And then, of course, with slander, tearing down another person's reputation, whether it's truth or not, just so that that person is less. And so it goes all through this. And so, again, if my life is going to change, I'm going to make a disciplined choice of fervently loving people. And maybe the first place it's going to show is how I communicate. And then finally, discipline with our desire for God's word. I'm so glad how the next chapter really begins with this, but at the same time, it's all connected together because man put in the chapters and verses. So it's all flowing together in the mind of God for us to know as a whole body of truth. So here's what he says. Our desire for the, for the word of God. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. Now, that's not talking about that you'll grow up to be saved. It's kind of like you're in it, and now you grow in it. Circle the word long for, thirsty for, or really drunk for God's word. I don't know. I told you a long time ago that when Carol, when we were, well, she led me to the Lord. We weren't dating, but she gave me my first Bible. I was so excited about the Bible, and then my mom and dad saw me reading the Bible, and they weren't really anti-Bible. They were just scared that I'd become a weird Christian. 
And so they said, do not read that book. You don't need that book. You're wasting your time. So it's okay to have the book, but spend more time doing this other stuff. So I, I'm right or wrong, I, I'm not saying this is the best, but for me, I needed the word. I was such, I would put the sheet over my head at night with a flashlight. You know, you hear all these kind of jokes like that. You're looking at a boy who did that. You're looking at a boy who went to work for his dad and so during lunch break I would sneak the radio Bible class little study booklets, not, not those little cheapy little devotional daily bread stuff. I'm talking about the, the teaching booklets that they would give out back in the early 60s. How many of you remember know what I'm talking about? And I would read those and I kept those because I wanted to know God's Word. I'm wondering though if sometimes we have gotten um, so much accessibility to God's Word. It's on my smartphone, it's on my computer, it's right here. I can get it almost anywhere. I could walk maybe a hundred feet in this building and I'll find either a Bible that we have or one of your Bibles you forgot. Anyway, I'll leave that alone. There's Bibles everywhere. But do we really hunger so when we open the Bible, we want to know God? You hear what I said? We want to know God. So if I could close this little session for today, here's what I'd like you to take home with you. We're going to have problems in this world, but that's okay. And so God wants us to think differently. And based on that new thought pattern because of Christ, he wants us to behave differently. And frankly, when we behave differently, it is highly probable that you will even have more trials in this life when you decide to take a stand for honesty, decency, and integrity. And let me say it more frankly. When you decide to really go public for Jesus, when you come out of the closet for Jesus, you're going to have some of those trials. But God also says that we need to have a different lifestyle. And that lifestyle needs to be one that's born out of real love. His love for us, in us, and because of Him for others. And it'll show up in our conversation that we won't speak negatively. And I wish I had time to say that we'd speak positively to build up. And it's because we have a sincere desire, a hunger, a longing for this book. I read an illustration. I don't know how true it is, so I have to be careful about preaching this as actual fact. But at least the illustration said this. That when the early Bible, before it was printed, when they had copies of it, they had to station people by it so it wouldn't be stolen. And then when it went up into some religions and they certainly had it, then only certain uh, religious leaders were allowed to have a Bible and to be able to speak it to the people. And I think some of you know what I'm trying to say kindly. And now we have so much accessibility to the Bible, we're kind of like we're drunk on the Bible. I mean, it's not like we've had so much. And I pray that that's not the case. I pray that you will hunger for the word. If you say, well, pastor, I, I struggle with that. How will I have more hunger for the word? Simple as simple as simple as pie. When you humble yourself and you recognize how needy we really are, when we look at the world that God has lifted us in and a world that desperately needs Christ that is so complicated and convoluted that we cannot do it apart from God's word, when we have that commitment to Christ and to his cause, Christ first, cause second, it will bring out a supernatural response to have more of this book. And the more we read this book, the sweeter Jesus will become and the more passionate we'll want others to know about the sweetness of our best friend in God, Jesus Christ. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed. Did God speak to you today? He screamed at me when I was putting this together, doing the research for this and reading commentaries. I guess I was so convicted by it because I saw how easy it is for me to be a Christian for so long and know all this stuff. Yeah, he wants me to think differently. I already know that. Yeah, I, I know I got to behave differently. I am. Listen, I'm not like the world, you know. Yeah, I have a different lifestyle. That's true. I, I do that. I don't drink or smoke or chew and that kind of stuff. I don't do drugs. and I'm not running around with women and all that. But I was really confronted with the reality of it all that God wants something so much more for me. And I have to let the Lord speak to me through this passage. And when he did it, it was because I went back to the portion that said, Jesus died on the cross for me. His blood was shed for me. And it wasn't just that salvation in the past. It was that progressive spiritual growth for today. 
So I'm going to give just two invitations, no altar call, no aisle walk, but two mental decisions, an invitation. First of all, for those of you that are saying, I am ready to become a Christian. I know that becoming a Christian, I will be inherently take on more trials and challenges. Immediately, it might start with my family when they find out about it. When at work, they see me not laugh at their jokes and perhaps not prevaricate. When I'm more honest, I know that I'm going to get a little hee-haw back. But that's all right. I'm ready for that because I want my sins forgiven. I want a home in heaven. I want an eternal relationship with Jesus where He'll never leave me nor forsake me. I've always wanted to live better with other people, but I didn't know how, it, how to do that. I didn't know where it began. It begins at the cross. The work was done for you. You need to trust Him. So would you simply say this to the Lord? Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to spend eternity separated from you in a horrible place that the Bible calls hell. But Lord, you said you'd take me into your forever family and you'll never cast me out and I'll have eternal life in, in that relationship because of what you did for me on the cross. So Lord, I'm going to trust that that work you did for me on the cross was enough. I'm going to trust your word that says that if I trust in you, that you'll forgive me of all sin and you're a God who cannot lie. So Lord, I am relying totally on you for not only the forgiveness of my sin, but that you'll take me in your forever family and give me this new life. And I want to be different. So, Lord, I'm trusting in you to do that. That's the first invitation. Are any of you ready to make that choice right now? Has the Holy Spirit already begun the work in you where you're ready to trust Him? And if you're ready to do that, do it right now. Do it right now. Now, if you're doing that in your heart to the Lord, I believe Jesus died for me. I'm trusting in you, Lord. Then I want you to know that I'd like to pray for you as your friend and perhaps pastor. And when I pray for you, I'm not going to have you stand up, come forward. I'm not going to do anything outwardly because it's a private thing right now. But I want to pray for you. And when I pray for you, I won't mention your name in my prayer. I won't come back to you where you're in the aisle out there in a chair. I won't touch you. I'm just going to lift you up as a, a new brother or sister in Christ in prayer. That's all. I'll just say, God bless you, and I'll take you to the Lord. So is there anyone in here today that would say to me, today was the day that I trusted Christ as my Savior. I was born again into God's family. And so, Pastor, pray for me. I trusted Christ as my only hope to heaven. Would you slip up your hand? Is there anyone at all? Put it up right now, real high so I can see it. Anyone at all? Never done it before. Do it right now. All right. Now, Christians, the second invitation is for us. This is an invitation that the Lord also is perhaps, I don't know if it's an invitation or not, but he's, he's wanting us to make a choice. Are some of you sensing that you have not been a whole lot different than the world? Maybe you're the best that you can be as a best non-Christian. That's, that's all right. But at the same time, that non-Christian will never tell others how to have eternal life. That non-Christian will never take a stand for Christian principles can never do it for the long haul or be sustained. And you're now ready to say, you know what, Pastor? I am now ready to make the Lord the Lord of my life. Not to be saved, but because I am. I want today, from today forward, I am now asking the Lord to help me to think and act differently because I want a different lifestyle because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. Pastor, pray for me because today is the day that I do want to be different. And I'm asking God to help me to live out that holiness that's already in Him that now is in me through him to others. Pastor, pray for me. I've got some work to do on loving others. I have some work to do on the way I communicate. I have some work to do on my passion for the word. Would you pray for me now? Would you put up your hand right now? I'd like to pray for anyone. Else. Put it up real high. Amen. Amen. Now, you don't have to raise your hand. You can make that thing. It's really between you and the Lord anyway. This is just for those who would like for me to pray for them. Our Father, we do humble ourselves before you, and I pray that... You now, the Holy Spirit, will take the Word of God and speak to our heart and to our mind and let us know what area is out of order, what area are we now becoming more like the world in and we need to kind of come back again and have that biblical and Christian, not just worldview, but lifestyle. So help us, Father, now to live this life of separation unto you from the inside out because we love you. 
In Jesus' name, amen. This is Joe Pons, and I want to thank you for listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Clarity Christian College. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It's the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. That's makeitclear.org. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please email us at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. That's tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.